in Park View. I'm going to ask him to stand if you can. Happy Sunday. So glad that you are with us. The book of Psalms says, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name almost high, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your words, Lord. How profound are your thoughts. Come on, let's clap our hands like this. And let's sing to God this morning for all he is and all he's done. I give thanks, we say, to you, Lord. And sing praise to your name, O Most High. I declare your love in the morning. That's right. And your faithfulness by night for you. Rejoice in what you have done. Sing it again, church. I give thanks to you, Lord. To you, Lord. Hey. And sing praise to your name, O Most High. Oh, I will declare, I declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. Rejoice in what you have done. We rejoice and rejoice in what you have done. Come on, church, we say, Oh Lord, how great are your words. Oh Lord, how great are your words. Oh Lord, how great are your words. We say, You have made me glad. Oh Lord, how great are your words. Oh Lord, 
on, let's continue worshiping God. Clap your hands like this. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Chris. He's a good God. He's a mighty God. And we worship him for everything he is and for all that he's done. He deserves our praise. raise our voices today and declare these words together as for more of the Holy Spirit in your life. Sing it out with us. Like the rain. Like the rain come pour. Come on somebody say. Overflow night of flame that won't burn.
them how we sing. There's just some problems only God can fix. There'll be some moments that just don't make sense. Yeah. I've seen it happen time and time again. There's just some problems only God can fix. There's just some battles flesh and blood can't win. That's right, that's right. There'll be some moments that just don't make sense. Can't see it now, but I'm still convinced. There's just some problems only God can Come on, church, we say. Not by power, not by mind. Yeah. By the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God. Not my battles, not my fight. By the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God. seen a breakthrough that I can't explain. Come on, so far. I found a healing hidden in my pain. I know a dead Somebody sing it to God this morning. My help, defend. Yeah, we declare in this place. Oh, 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 oh. someone let the people know anything is possible. No weapon will prosper. Oh, come on, church. We sing it again. We declare. My fortress, my refuge, in the strong tower.
situation, he is it's still a strong town. We're still a strong town. In your depression and your sickness, he's still a strong town. You are not alone. He's by your side today. He's still a strong town. Still a strong town. Thank you for your promise, God. Still a strong town. Come on, my fortress, my refuge. Still a strong town. Come on, church, declare this is your worship to Him, Defender, Defender. Still a strong tower. Still a strong tower. Someone let the people know anything is possible. Declare it, say, no weapon will prosper. Still a strong Come on, church, one more time, declare with all you guys, say. My fortress, my refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Hey. My helper, defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Oh, oh, oh. Someone let the devil know, tell him that he's got to go. No weapon will prosper, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Says God, you know, the reason why we can come to this place and sing this out, the reason why we can say that He is our refuge, that He is our strong tower, that He is our helper, that He is our defender, is that no matter what we're going through, no matter how we walked into this place, we can sing this out with confidence because, because we know of the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that it is by His power, it is by His might. It's nothing that we can manufacture. It's nothing that we can that we can buy. But it's a gift that God gives to His people, to those who follow Him, to those who love Him. The power of the Holy Spirit, y'all. Church is alive and well, and it is time for us to live in that. It's time for us to to claim that. That it's not anything that we can do, but it's only through Him. So I wonder if you can just lift up your hands and we can sing this out today. That it's not by power, that it's not by our might, but only by His Holy Spirit. However it is that you find yourself this morning, whatever situation that you are walking in, that you are facing right now, just declare these words. Come on, let's sing. Not by power, not by might. Come on, tell them. By the that is enough sometimes that's that's all we gotta say who you are that is enough for us to be grateful today that is enough for us to worship you and to praise you because you are a good God you are a mighty God a perfect God and we are grateful for the reminder that we are not walking alone for the reminder God that you are fighting for us and it is nothing that we can do but it's by your spirit it's by your strength. It's by your might. So I pray, God, for my brothers and sisters in this room. I pray for those watching online as well. That whatever it is that we are facing, whatever it is that, that is tormenting us, God, whatever doubt or uncertainty that waits for us, God, I pray that you help us to trust you that you help us to surrender and in our doubt, in our sickness, in our depression, in our unhealthiness, God, that we can still say that you are our refuge, that we can still cling to your promise and to your word, that you will keep us safe and that you will watch over us. So thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your grace. I pray for peace, for strength, for faith, for hope, for discernment, God, for my brothers and sisters, for anybody that needs it right now. By your power, by your mind, by the goodness of your Holy Spirit. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen and amen. Don't make me see it. Amen. 
Thank you, Carlos and band. Appreciate it. Worshiping with you this morning. And if you are uh, a guest with us, we're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. You are looking really good. Your extra hour of sleep. You guys look a little extra rested. Except the parents. The parents don't get an extra hour of sleep because the kids, the kids get up regardless. But uh, we're glad that you're here. And uh, there's some people out in the lobby that would love to get to know you and meet you, especially if you're a guest and you're trying to get to know a little bit more about uh, who Parkview is and uh, how to engage in this community. So there's some folks out at the tables called Next. They have a gift for you and also uh, just would love to hear uh, a little bit about uh, your story. Uh, two quick things before we get into our sermon. Uh, next week, we are hosting a prayer night in this auditorium. Uh, for the conflict that's happening in Israel-Palestine. And we just felt like as a church, it's really important that we come together and that we pray because this is, uh, first of all, it's what Scripture calls us to do when there are uh, brothers and sisters that are hurting and in pain to lift them up in prayer. But we also understand that this is just a really uh, complicated uh, situation. And Ray Kay actually has a, a kind of unique experience with Israel-Palestine. He's been there a handful of times. He's really become a student of the region and of the politics and of the history. And so he's going to spend some time giving a little bit of context uh, first, and then we're going to spend some time praying uh, as believers for other, specifically other believers in the area, but also just praying that the violence would end uh, and that there would be an end to just the senseless loss of life uh, in the area. So we encourage you to come next week at 6 p.m. We're going to be in the auditorium uh, learning a little bit, but then also spending significant time uh, in prayer together. The second thing I want to call your attention to uh, is our Thanksgiving meal. This is something, especially if you're new, you might not know about us, but this is our 39th consecutive year serving a meal to the community. And the goal of this is just to provide a gift to the community. There really are no strings attached. We just understand that while Thanksgiving can be a really fun and festive time for some families, for others it can really it can be a difficult time. It can be a time where you're reminded maybe of what you don't have or maybe even what you've lost. And so for the past 39 years, we've opened our space or uh, in times that we had to get creative, we uh, were creative. But for the most part, we've opened our space uh, to the community and said, we have a warm, homemade Thanksgiving meal for you if you need a place to go. Uh, but one of the best things about this meal is it involves the entire church. We ask everyone to get involved and to go shopping for the things that we need. And so you might have noticed a, a display in the lobby that is all festive and thanksgiving E. Uh, and there's a sign-up online of all the different things that we need to pull off uh, the meal. And you can sign up to bring a specific uh, item. And then uh, over the course of the next two weeks, you can bring them here uh, on a Sunday and put them kind of at that display. And that will help us with the meal. If you're like, I'm not really a shopper, I don't even shop for my own family, grocery shopping is not something that I do, I don't know how you eat, but if that's something that's like, I don't do that, uh, then there's also, we also would love to receive uh, financial um, donations as well that would help us buy things like the turkeys and stuff. We don't collect turkeys, we buy the turkeys. And so if that is more your speed, there's an opportunity to do that as well. And then above all of that, there are different places to serve to help this uh, meal take place. So day of, there are certainly opportunities to serve, but leading up to it, there's also uh, opportunities to carve turkeys or something called a stuffing night, which I don't think means you just come and eat stuffing. But I have to double check on that, but that would be very well attended. There's a green bean night, which same thing. I don't think you come and eat green beans, but you're helping prep and you're helping uh, get things ready for the day of. So if the day of, you already have commitments or you're out of town, but you want to serve, there's plenty of opportunities to serve leading up to Thanksgiving, okay? Uh, today we are in week three of our series called In Real Life. This is a series that we've been talking about, uh, the tension between the authentic and the inauthentic. And especially as it relates to social media and the internet, there is such a, a temptation and such a kind of barrage of opportunities to present a very curated, very sanitized, uh, very manicured, put together version of yourself or your family. Uh, and oftentimes that image that we portray or that we have curated doesn't always line up with who we actually are and what is true about ourselves. And so the first week we just looked, Jake, Jake opened up the series, and he just looked at this in general, this idea of what it means to be authentic. He used a really clever passage, uh, I think, to do it. He talked about John the Baptist, who was continually being asked to be someone that he was not. There was pressure from, from people saying, are you this? Are you that? Gain more power, gain more popularity. And John the Baptist consistently said, no, that's not who I am. I am the person that is preparing the way for the person. And so he lived this incredible life of authenticity and, um, and, so, and vulnerability even. And so we talked about that week one to set the stage. 
And then last week, Ray gave one of the best messages I've heard on finances. Finances is one of these things that maybe we can portray that we have it all together. Maybe we can portray that we have enough or that we have more than enough, that we can afford everything that we have. Uh, but what, what power do finances have in our actual real life, in our heart and in our soul? And he did a really great job using King Solomon as an example uh, to draw us back to the power that finances can have. And this week we talk about parenting, what it means to parent in real life. And so what I want to do first, before we get into kind of the meat of the message, is I want to offer a little bit of a disclaimer. And that is, when you hear that the message is on parenting, there is a temptation to check out, especially if you are in the, the room and you are not in a season of parenting. And I want to say two things to that. One, I want to vulnerably share with you that I sat in that seat many times, both as growing up in the church, but even in my adult life, I sat in parenting messages when I wasn't a parent. And I know from personal experience that that can be difficult, and that can be challenging, it can be awkward, and it can even be um, uncomfortable at times. And so what I'm asking you to do today is to not check out, but to engage with the content, even if you're not in a season of parenting. And I simply want to say that if that is hard for you or that is difficult for you, I understand. I mean, I don't understand everything because I don't know all of your stories. I don't know everything that you've been through. But I understand as someone who has sat in the seat that you are sitting in, that I'm asking you to sit in, I understand that sometimes messages about parenting are uncomfortable and even difficult. And so I get that. But I, what I want you to do today is to lean in, if you're willing. And I want you to do some hard work with me uh, today. I want you to do the best that you can to take the things that we are talking about today and to apply them to your context, even if you're not in a season of parenting. Because I think what we're going to do today, the scripture that we're going to read and the things we're going to talk about apply to everyone. But specifically, we are going to talk about what it means as it relates to parenting. But I do think it applies to everyone. And so what I'm asking you to do is to do the hard work to discern how the things that we talk about today impact and intersect with your life. And I keep saying it's hard work because I know it's hard work because that's what I do every time I step on this stage. As I take something that is true in scripture and I say, okay, where does it intersect our life? And then how do I inspire people to live at the intersection? section of truth and practice. That's the task of a preacher, and it is hard work, but I'm asking you to do that with me today because I might not be able to contextualize every point for a non-parent in the room. So I'm asking you if you would give a little extra effort this morning to contextualize what we say about Scripture and what we say about God for your specific instance, okay? Can we do that? You nod your head if we can. Okay, don't nod it this way. Who nodded, <laughs> nodded this way? All right. So to that end, let me just pray for us. Father, we ask that you meet us where we are, exactly where we are. And we even acknowledge that that is a bit of a miracle that we're asking, that we would ask that your spirit would individually speak to the hundreds of people this morning that have heard this message and then would somehow uh, contextualize it for their specific life circumstance. Father, we ask that you do that. We ask that you do that every time we gather together and open scripture. We specifically ask it for this morning. We pray this all in your name. Amen. And we specifically asked the question, what does parenting look like in real life, you know, to, to correlate with the series, because we realize there is so much content online, especially about what it means to parent. Parent influencers are everywhere. There's all of these blogs and all of these uh, posts and reels and videos telling you how you should parent, giving you parental advice. You might be familiar with these. Uh, parenting hacks. Apparently, it's, you can call something a hack, and it's cooler than just calling it an advice, even if it's the same advice that we've been given for decades. But it's parenting hacks, and it's things like how to do, uh, you know, how to avoid screen time, or if you have to use screen time, here are the 10 shows that are the best shows to watch for your kid if you must resort to screen time. You know, 101 crafts to do this summer, you know, when it's snowing outside organic, healthy recipes that your picky eater will love, right? How to take the dream vacation for X amount of dollars, you know, with your growing family. How to set boundaries with your teenagers. How to date your spouse when you have four kids living under one roof. And, that, and the, the advice, the hacks just keep coming and coming and coming. And you have all these Instagram influencers telling you what it means to be a successful parent. Success as it relates to Amazon's algorithms, or to Instagram's algorithms, right? Success as it relates to what the algorithms think you need to know as a parent. 
And so what we want to look at today is, is that truly what success is? Does creating these, following this advice, creating the most curated, happy, well-put-together, well-mannered, well-adjusted family, is that truly what success looks like as a parent? Because I think what this pressure has done, what all of these, these hats, all this advice has done, is it has increased the pressure to do this thing right. Not only has it told you how to do it, but it says if you're, you, better, you better be trying hard to do it. Because look at all of these other parents that are doing it better, more correctly. And so then it has produced us, a culture and a society, I think. I don't have research for this. This is just what I see on my feed. It has produced kind of this need to then post and to share how successful your family is, how well-adjusted your kids are, how cute they are, how funny they are, how they scored the winning goal, how they got accepted to this college, how they just had their first job, how they look so great in their homecoming attire, whatever. It has produced this like desire to say, look, I'm doing it right. I, I am successful. I am successful according to what the internet and the algorithms have told me is success. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. At the end of September, uh, there was this like 83 degree weekend. Do you remember this weekend? It was glorious. And Britton and I woke up that day and we said, we have to do something today because pretty soon it will be snowing, okay? We didn't think it would be Halloween, but we knew it was going to be soon that the snow was coming, okay? So we said, we got to take advantage of this weekend. And so we went downtown. I love going downtown. And, uh, you know, Ben has been a few times. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Ben turns three tomorrow, which is crazy. And then Will turns one on Wednesday. So I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And so we said, we're going to go downtown, and we're going to have this great day. And we went downtown, and we did the Maggie Daly Park, which is full of all these, uh, you know, playgrounds. And there's these fountains. If you've, if you've been downtown, you know, you've that fountain that spits out, you know, the mouth and the you know what I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe you don't. Maybe you're not a downtown person, but super fun. So we went downtown, and we have this beautiful day together. And we took this picture. We took this unbelievable picture of Ben. We, we brought his swimsuit because we knew he was going to love playing in the fountain. And now I didn't post. We didn't post about this day. But if we would have posted about this day, this is one of the pictures we would have posted. Look at Ben. He's so happy. He's in his swimsuit. You can see the fountain in the background. It's a beautiful, it was a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful memory. We probably wouldn't have posted this picture that happened 30 seconds later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is him when we said it's time to take off your swimsuit and on to the next fun thing that we have planned for you. But he lost it. And he threw a typical two-and-a-half, three-year-old temper tantrum. This is what kids do. So here's the question. Which of those photos is real life? Both, right? Both photos are real life. We had an unbelievably fun and sweet and cute time with our little family And Ben, for 30 seconds to 60 seconds, had a meltdown when we had to move on to the next thing. Both are real. But here's the bit of an issue. The only thing that we tend to post, or the only stories that we tell if we're not online, the only pictures that we print if we're old school, is the first picture, right? I don't see a lot of the second picture online. And let me quickly say, I'm okay with that. I don't need to see your kids crying all on my feet, okay? Truly. I'm not here to say, unless you're going to post your kid being unhappy, don't post anything. No, I don't want to see your kid crying. I know your kid cries. I don't need you to post 10 pictures of your kid having a bad day, okay? So I'm not here to say, you got to post both. What I am saying, though, is that when we only post the first, or we only show the first, or only tell the story of the first, if we're not careful, we can trick ourselves, or we can forget that real life is both photos, both experiences. And we can, we can forget that that family behind that photo, there probably is a crying baby behind, the, you know, in their, in their phone, in their reel. But we can tend to forget that. I know your kid's poop smells as bad as my kid's poop. I know that. I do, I think, I'm pretty sure. Maybe even worse, depending on what you feed them. But what happens is when we only hear the stories, when we only see the photos, when we only experience that first picture, we tend to think that's real life. And it is real life, but it's only half of real life. The other half are hard moments, our meltdowns, our tears, our negotiations with a toddler, our boundaries with your eighth grader, our disappointments from colleges for your 11th grader. That is also real life. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to suggest uh, kind of an alternative to what is success as a parent. What is our role as parents? I just think this. I think our role as parents is to do everything that we can 
to instill a lifelong commitment in our children to humbly and to faithfully follow God. Our role as parents is to do everything that we can as parents to instill in our children a lifelong commitment of humbly and faithfully following God. And I say that like it's easier than the alternative, but I actually think it's probably more difficult than just snapping the cute picture of your kid at Millennium Park or whatever. It's difficult. And part of why it is so difficult is because I intentionally said to do everything that we can as parents because there's only so much you can do as parents, right? You can't make your kid make certain decisions. You can't make your kid decide to love Jesus. You can't make your kid say, I am going to follow God for the rest of my days. They have to choose that. And so what is difficult is you do everything you can as a parent to set your kid up for success, to set your kid up for a decision that will result in him him or her having a lifelong commitment to humbly and faithfully following God. But you can only go so far. And let me just say that is so difficult as a parent. Because some of you know Some of you know the pain that comes when you do that and your kid decides not to follow after Jesus. And you've done your work. You've you've humbly and faithfully modeled what it looked like. You've done your best. You're not perfect. No one's perfect, but you've done your best to, to honestly and to earnestly model what it means to follow God. And your kid, for whatever reason, isn't walking with Jesus right now. Man, that is hard. That breaks your heart as a parent. It's also hard because some of you are sitting here and you're like, where were you 15 years ago, right? I, I've missed it on this. This sounds lovely, but my kid is now 20. My kid is now 30. My kid is now 16. And I feel like I haven't been doing this. I came to Christ later, or I got serious about my faith later, or I, was, I spent a decade dealing with some of my demons, and so I, did I miss the boat I just want to tell you, it is never too late. It is never too late to do everything you can to instill a lifelong commitment in your kids to humbly and faithfully follow God. It's just never too late. In fact, it is one of the most powerful things to come to your kids later in life and say, listen, I I did miss it. I wasn't what I should have been in your early years And my life has been changed by the power of God, by the grace of God. And so I want to model to you now, even though you're 20, even though you're 30, I want to model to you now what it looks like to be someone that is humbly walking after God. And if you're willing to let me have an influence in your life, this is the influence I want to have. I want to show you, I want to emulate, I want to to preach to you with my words and my actions what it means to follow Jesus. It is not too late. It's difficult. It's humbling. But it's not too late. There's a text in Deuteronomy 6 that I want to use just for, the, for our morning together. And Deuteronomy 6 is like the, the John 3.16 of the Hebrew Scriptures, or the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. This is the, this is the text that, that Jewish people would know and recite and have memorized that would be a part of their rituals. And in this text, Moses is preaching a sermon, kind of a, a recapture of the law, of, of God's covenant to his people. And they're about to, to enter into the Holy Land and, and set up their nation the way that God has asked them to and designed. And so he preaches these, this final sermon in Deuteronomy. And there's a, specifically a section in Deuteronomy 6 that I think applies for us today. This is what it says. These are the commands, the decrees, and the laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Why? So that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. So Moses says, make sure to do the things that that God has asked you to do, the law, the covenant that God has set before you. Do those things. And why? So that your kids will know and so that your kids will eventually fear the Lord. And then it goes on. This this verse specifically is kind of like the John 3.16. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Get this, and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. 
Moses says, impress on your children, impress into them what it means to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Impress on them. And when you wake up in the morning, start talking about it. And when you, before you go to bed, start talking about it. And when you're on your way somewhere, which people are always on their way in the ancient Near East, you're always walking somewhere. When you're walking with your kids, talk about it. Impress on your kids who God is. Then he goes on. In the future... Your son's going to ask you, what's the meaning of the stipulations, the decrees, the laws that the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell him this. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and on Pharaoh and on his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord so that we might always prosper, be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Moses says, one day your kids are going to ask. One day your kids are going to ask, why do we do all the things that we do? Why do we keep Sabbath? Why do we go to festivals? And why do we do sacrifices? And why do we keep all of these laws? Dad, Mom, what's the deal with all of this stuff? He says, and when that happens, be prepared to tell your son or your daughter the reason we do that is because God has been faithful to us, because God has delivered us, because God loves us. And so we keep his commands, not as a, out of obligation, did you catch this, but to bring life, to prosper, And so when your kids ask you, Mom, Dad, why do we go to church on Sunday? Why are you always talking to me about giving? Why are you always serving? Why are you always praying? Why are you always worshiping? When they ask you, if you're doing those things, and they see it, and your son or your daughter asks you, why are you doing those things? Be prepared to give an answer. It's because God has delivered me. It's because God has been faithful. It's because God loves us and because I love God. Impress on your children what it means to follow God. Impress on your children who God is. Tell your kids. Tell your kids' kids. I see some grandparents in here. Tell your kids' kids. You're not off the hook. And you're like, I'm, you know, this is the awkward part where it's like, I'm not in the season of parenthood, Andy. Okay. I, my guess is you have nieces and nephews. Tell them. Tell them who God is. I heard through the grapevine that if you beg children's ministry or student ministry, they will find a place for you to serve on Sunday morning or on Sunday night. (laughs) Maybe, I don't know. Tell the next generation. You're like, I don't have nieces and nephews. Okay, serve on Sunday morning with our kids. Serve on Sunday Sunday night with our students. Tell the next generation of the goodness of God. And one of the things we don't have time to to really dive into today, but there is this image that comes up, especially in the New Testament, about this idea of the church being a family. And I think it's so clever because families, even in in, in ancient times, but especially now, families can be super dysfunctional and can be super tricky. And so for some people, that that language of family is a little bit triggering, a little bit like, well, if this family is anything like my family, I don't want anything to do with it. But let me suggest it also could be incredibly healing. Because regardless of what your family of origin is like, the scripture says that together as a church, we are a family, which means that even if you don't have your own kids, collectively we have children in our midst. We have the next generation here. I see some of the kids in the auditorium right now, and I love this. And it, it's also great because you can keep your parents accountable to what we're talking about right now. You're like, Remember when Pastor Andy said you had to be nice? You can say that, okay? We have kids in our midst. We are a family, And so there are likely people that you love that have kids. There are neighbors that you love that have kids. There are people sitting next to you that have kids. And what it means to be a part of a family is that we do this together. And so this is is the time I'm going to try and contextualize this for those that aren't parents right now, is that even if you don't have kids of your own, you are not off the hook from telling the next generation of the goodness and the beauty and the wonder of God. Can I get an amen for that? Okay? Tell your kids. Tell your kids. Last week, Ben and I were having dinner together, and um, we were just playing a game together. It was super fun and cute, and we were talking, and we played this little game where we were talking about different things that we love. And so I said, I love Ben, and he says, I love Daddy, and I said, I love Mom, and he says, I love Will, and I love Nana, and I love Grandma, and it was super cute. And he goes, 
I love Jesus. Oh, my gosh. So I got to share this in the message. This is perfect. You did a perfect job, Ben, you know, a week before the message. And so I said, wow, you know, tears were starting to kind of well in my eyes. I said, Ben, you love Jesus? He said, no, I love cheese. <laughs> Man, you sure you didn't say Jesus? No? Okay, real life. What kind of cheese do you want? I mean, we just went on. <laughs> so he's not there yet. He's three. I was like, man, this is going to be brilliant. But tell your kids. This is what it means to be a successful parent. And let me quickly, before we get into a few little applications, let me quickly say that creating fun and cute and wholesome, unique experiences with your kids and Deuteronomy 6 parenting are not mutually exclusive. Right? You can create and curate and have amazing opportunities and fun with your kids and post cute pictures and, and go to Disney with the matching shirts on. And you can do all of that and still be a Deuteronomy 6 parent. Okay, They're not necessarily intention. You can do both. You can prioritize a great first birthday party or you know, the really cool outing or whatever. My point, all I'm trying to do is just to make sure that our priorities are in order, to make sure that we don't, we don't prioritize the algorithm version of what it means to be a successful parent over the Deuteronomy 6 version of what it means to be a successful parent, okay? And so three quick ways that I think we can lean into what it means to be this Deuteronomy 6 parent. And they're super simple. They're not, they're not, you know, they're not super influential or whatever. They're super simple. By what we say, by what we do, and by reducing the power of comparison. First thing, by what we say. How do, how, do, how do we instill, how do we impress upon our kids who God is and what he has done in our life? Well, by what we, by what we say. I'm still getting used to the fact that I have a three-year-old that hears and then repeats everything, okay? I'm still getting used to that. And it's super humbling. It's very humbling when he, when he says something and you think, where did you hear that? Hmm, probably me, or probably Brittany, but probably me. Um, Nothing too bad yet, mostly cute things. Like, for instance, when, when you say thank you to Ben, he says, you're very welcome. It's adorable, right? He definitely got that from me. Um, <laughs> but it is super humbling because they hear everything and they repeat everything. So what are they hearing? Whether they're 3 or 13 or 33, what are they hearing come out of your mouth? And I don't just mean are they hearing, like, cuss words or bad words or you making fun of someone. I mean, you should certainly consider that. Uh, you should certainly evaluate that. But I don't just mean, are you saying bad words? But are they hearing anything of benefit, anything of value? Are they hearing scripture ever come out of your mouth? Are they hearing their parents pray? Are they hearing their parents worship? What are they hearing out of your mouth? What are they experiencing as you talk to people? You don't think they're listening, but they are. They are always, always listening. So what are they hearing? Do they ever hear out of your mouth the story of God's faithfulness? Both as it's described in Scripture, but also as it has played out in your own life. Maybe even in their grandparents' life. Are they hearing the story of God's faithfulness? Are they hearing the character of God come out of your mouth? And listen, this is different for every season of parenthood. I'm in the, I'm in the little kid season. And so this is bedtime stories and acting it out with cute little, you know, little people, Noah's Ark things and songs in the car that just are on repeat, right? You might have a middle school student that eye rolls at everything, okay? Maybe not your middle school student, but most middle school students, they eye roll at everything. And so you have to pick and choose how, you, how you're going to share the goodness and the faithfulness of God. You have to find strategic moments. It might be in the car on the way home from a party. It might be uh, in an early morning where you both find yourself awake for some reason. Say, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk to my kid about what's really going on in their life and to point them towards the goodness and the wholeness that comes with following God. It might come after their first breakup or their first college rejection letter or whatever, you have to find your moments because it is different. You have to be creative and you have to be intentional. It's a little easier in one sense to just say, to, to do it at bedtime with a three-year-old. But when you have a 15-year-old, how are you going to share the goodness and the story of God's faithfulness to your kids? Will they ever hear it come out of your mouth? 
Will they hear you reference scripture when your family is going through a difficult time? When they have a difficult decision to make, when you have a difficult decision to make, what will they hear you say? And what will they see you do? We have what you say, but it's also by what you do. And those things better line up, because if they don't, it doesn't really matter what you say if they witness you not doing the things that you say. And so what are your students, what are your children, what are your adult children, what are your grandchildren seeing you do? How are they seeing you engage with your neighbor? How are they seeing you engage with politics? How are they seeing you prioritize your money? How are they seeing you prioritize your time? How are they seeing how you manage stress when you have a stressful situation at work or a stressful situation at home or in your personal life or a health scare? How are they seeing you manage that stress? How are they seeing you treat your spouse? How are they seeing you, seeing you treat your, your ex-spouse? How are they seeing you treat your difficult in-laws? Not my in-laws, if you're watching, Lauren. You're, you guys are great, John and Lauren. But you might have difficult in-laws. <laughs> How are they seeing you treat grandma and grandpa? What, what are they seeing you do? Because your priorities will become your kids' priorities. The things that you do, your kids are going to emulate. Again, this is whether your kids are 5, 15, or 35. Listen, I'm 35 years old. I still want to see my parents live out the implications of the gospel. I still want to hear my parents pray. I still want to hear my parents recite scripture. I still want to see my parents worship. I still want to be encouraged by their sacrificial giving. I still want to see how they tell others about Jesus. I still want to see how they serve in the community because it still matters to me, even though I'm 35 years old. So listen, if you're like, this isn't for me, I already did my parent thing. You are never done parenting. You are never done modeling to your children what it looks like to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and strength. Amen? So what are they seeing you do? What are they hearing you say? And then lastly, and this is more for you than for them, I think Deuteronomy 6 can help alleviate kind of the, the tension of comparison. Listen, comparison is inevitable. And it certainly doesn't help with kind of the online presence of everyone posting what they're posting and all that stuff. But I think when you have Deuteronomy 6 as your core, as your like true north of like this is what it means to parent, you can be a little less distracted by the cute photo or the college acceptance or the kid that made the varsity team. You can be a little less like, oh, my kid didn't do that or I didn't do that as a parent. And you can be a little more like, but no, the primary thing that I am called to do is to do everything that I can to instill a lifelong commitment to God and to, to help my, my children humbly and faithfully follow him. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so these other things, while it still might kind of eat at you at times, having Deuteronomy 6 as your core, as your callback, can help reduce the power of comparing your life, your family, your kids to others. But I will say it's difficult. And it doesn't even have to be online. The other day, uh, we went, Ben's at preschool. Toddler's campus has a early threes. And so even though Ben isn't quite three yet, there's a beginner's class. It's super cute. And so we, we love it over there. And um, there was a party that I... I signed up to help with. Brittany and I said, well, we'll help with the party in Ben's class. And so we go, and I had never done this before. I had no idea what I was getting into with a, with a preschool party. And so we get to kind of the outside of the class, and one of the teachers comes out and says, okay, parents, like, here's the roadmap for the next two hours, and here's where, uh, I think it was an hour, and here's, it felt like two hours, and here's what I need out of you. <laughs> and she said, okay, the first thing we're going to do is the craft. Oh, my face went lifeless. Brittany knows I am the least crafty person you have ever met. And I got, I was like, craft, we have to craft? I said craft, not crap. Craft, we have to craft? No, we have to craft? And Brittany just started laughing in the group of parents. And she's like, Andy, you're going to be okay crafting? I said, I don't know, let's see what this craft is. Well, it turns out I can do a three-year-old craft. It was not super complicated. But I was very scared I was going to mangle poor Charlotte's craft. And she was going to go home to her mom, like, what happened to your craft? I don't know, this big guy just mangled it, okay? But we were good. We got the things glued in the right spot, okay? So anyways, we're doing the, the, the party, and we're having fun. And I remember I was with Ben as we were kind of wrapping up, and, and two parents were talking to each other. They weren't talking to me, but it's kind of eavesdropping. Uh, I mean, it was a tight quarters. And um, these parents started talking about a milestone that their kids um, 
had recently achieved that Ben hadn't yet. And it had nothing to do with being online. It had nothing to do with a cute picture. They weren't even talking to me. But I remember thinking, oh, craft. I don't, <laughs> our kid hasn't done that yet. And I immediately started thinking, oh, man, is there something wrong with our kid, with our parenting? Why hasn't our kid hit that milestone yet? Right? And it starts, it's powerful. That was just a passing moment. Again, just, I wasn't expecting it. I'm, I usually don't even care what you people do with their kids because I'm so focused. But I was just like, in that moment, I was like, oh, man, have we missed it as parents? But I will say, Deuteronomy 6, I was prepping for this message. I was, Deuteronomy 6, am I doing everything that I can to instill a lifelong commitment in my children to humbly and faithfully follow God? And that helps reduce the power of comparison. Listen, I will say this as we close. This is hard work. Parenting is hard work. I never knew how selfish I was until I had kids. Some of you knew, I think, but didn't tell me, which I appreciate. But I never knew how much work it was, how much sacrifice it required out of you, how much intentionality it required. And I will say, this week leading up to this message, as things often play out like this, this was one of the hardest weeks of parenting that Britton and I have had. It's only been three years. We're new at this. But man, this was a hard week to parent. We were going through some things as a family and some ear infections and just in general, there were multiple times that Brittany and I looked at each other and we said, man, we are tired right now. We're tired. It is hard work parenting. And I will say, I do not, man, I, again, you probably like, I know this, Andy, you don't have to tell me this, but I do not get it right all the time. And it is so humbling to go to your three-year-old or more humbling to go to your spouse and say, I missed it in this moment. I was unkind, I was not patient, I was irritable. And then when your kid looks at you and says, calm down, daddy, it's like, okay, you're right. That didn't happen. Maybe it happened once this week. It's hard work. It is such hard work. But I think it's worth it. I think the Deuteronomy 6, above all, when you're, when you're, before you go to bed, when you wake up, when you're on your way, talk about the faithfulness of God. Talk about his character. Talk about who he is, whether your kid is five or 20 or 50, or you're talking about it with your grandkids, or you're talking about it with your nieces and your nephews, or the kids in your small group, if you're a middle school leader, or your friend's kids, because this is what it means to be a community and to parent together. Whatever it is, it is worth it to point people, to point children in the next generation to the goodness and the faithfulness and so what I want to do is I just want to pray a prayer. It's a really simple prayer. It's three lines. I just wrote it in response to what I was feeling as I wrote this message. And it's just a really simple prayer to ask God if he would help us as parents. Okay, so I'm going to pray this over us and over myself, and then we'll sing together. Father, give me the strength to parent my children with love, with patience, and with kindness. God, allow my children to know the depth of your love for them and protect them against the things of this world. May they love you and follow you humbly and faithfully. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. do something a little different as we close, okay? This, this song is a kind of a mashup of scripture. It's a new, number six, uh, Deuteronomy six, which we looked at. You'll see some of that language in the next part. And the language from the psalmist of this idea of generation, generations, children's, children's, children. And so it's kind of this mashup of pleading and asking with God that he would be with not just our kids, not just their kids, but generations to come that we will never even see. But that God's work would start in our lives and that we would pass it on and that people would be so so impressed by the power of God and his spirit that they would pass it on to their generation and so on. And so this is just this beautiful prayer. But what I wanted to do is to recite our own prayer, the prayer that, that I prayed at the end of the service. And I want to recite it together corporately. If it's something, if it's something that you desire for your family and for your kids. So no pressure if you're just not in that season or if that's something that you're not interested in doing. But we're going to read it together out loud. And I'm going to be a participant in it, not a leader in it, but a participant in it. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Carlos sometimes asks you to raise your hands as we worship as a way of, of, you know, physically having your posture reflect your heart of worship and surrender and submission. And so I'm going to ask that if you pray this prayer and you want this to be true of your family and your children, that you would also raise your hands in that same posture of worship and submission. In a posture of asking God, God, I can't do this on my own, so help me. As a posture of saying, God, I need you. And so if, if this is true of you, if you want this to be true of you, would you just raise your hand and recite this prayer out loud with me right now? And then we're going to sing the rest of the song. Father, give me the strength to parent my children with love, patience, and kindness. Allow my children to know the depth of your love for them and protect them against the things of this world. May they love you and follow you humbly and faithfully. Amen. Come on, let's send this out together. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may the Savior be upon you and a thousand generations
nations and your family and your children and your children and come on sing it again say please favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children please favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children come on baby encouraging to you, regardless of where you are on your parenting journey, whether you're in a season of parenting or not, my hope is that looking at scripture and looking at this this sermon from Moses was an encouragement to you this morning. We're so glad that you're here. We'd love for you to come back next week as we close out the series. And I also just want to draw your attention to this card that you'll get on the way out. We have a whole bunch of things over the holiday season that are meant to help engage with you and with your community. Uh, And so you'll, you'll see all those things listed on this holiday card Uh, to prep you for uh, the holiday season that's coming, all right? I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, we'll be on our way. Father, we just, we love you. We ask that you would give us the strength and the patience and the humility to invest in the next generation in a way uh, that honors you. God, we're so grateful that we have the story to tell, that you are a good and faithful and loving God. So I pray that we would be bold in sharing that news. Uh, with those around us. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, there's some people down front if you'd like to pray. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Just let it-